Hey, I'm Jamie from Stillmeyer Games, and today I'm going to talk about my top 10 favorite groups of games that, uh, that are similar to each other, and yet I still keep them all in my collection. Um, you may have seen videos from time to time from content creators that are like, oh, this game kills this game, or this game replaces this game. And I wanted to put a positive spin on that, that there are some games that are pretty similar in more than one way, and yet I really like both of them, or all of them, and I keep them all on my shelf for various reasons, or just because I like them. And so I wanted to kind of elevate these games that are similar, and yet they are still on my shelf. Um, and a little bit of this video ended up being essentially, if you like this game, you might also like this game. There's a lot of that going on here. Um, so I asked ambassadors this question. There's a great long list from ambassadors about games that they said. I tried to find groupings where multiple ambassadors, still my ambassadors, said similar things or paired uh, multiple games with the same game. Here is that list. Uh, Seven Wonders and Sushi Go and Between Two Cities. A separate one is, I, I'll just go down the list. Apiary, Honey Buzz, Teotihuacan or Rec Raiders, Arc Nova and Terraforming Mars. Brass, Barrage, and Nucleum, Cascadia and Carcassonne, or Calico, Plank, Quest for El Dorado, Lost Runes of Arnak, The Hunger, and The Witcher. And most of these, again, I'm leading off with the game that a lot of people paired other games with. Clans of Caledonia and Terra Mystica, Dixit and Detective Club, Dominion and Ascension, Valley of the Kings and DC Deck Building, Expeditions and Scythe, that makes perfect sense, Heat and either Downforce or Formula D, Hadrian's Wall and Three Sisters or Roll Through the Ages, Earth and either Wingspan or Raising Robots, Hive Mind and Herd Mentality or Just One, On Mars and Terraforming Mars or Anachrony, Pandemic and Horrified or Plague Inc., Raiders of the North Sea um, and either Euphoria or Raiders of Scythia, Space Base and either Bad Company or Machi Koro, Splendor and Century Spice Road, The Seventh Continent and Sleeping Gods, Viticulture and Lords of Water Deep or Venhos, Twilight Imperium and either Eclipse or Exodus Proxima, and then last, Wingspan and Earth Raising Robots, Terraforming Mars or Wormspan. I know that's a lot of names I just threw out at you, and I have more of them on my list too. Uh, some overlap, some not. Let me jump over to my list and we'll start going into these. And I'll explain the format as soon as I have this up on the screen. There we go. So I'm going to lead off. So these are, I'm going to lead off the first word, that, the first game that I'll name for each of these uh, categories, for each of these listings, um, is the one that I probably get to the table a little bit more often than the other one. But again, I keep both of these games or all of these games in my collection. These are all games currently in my collection. And so it means that I really do highly value them. There's that. There's also, there are some Stomar games on this list. Uh, they are grouped together with other non Stomar games, but I wanted to let you know that my company makes these games and they are on this list, or some of them, the Stomar versions. And um, I am just going to show you the first game that I mentioned because I it, it would be a lot of stuff to show you if I showed you every version of every, or every game that I mentioned today. So anyway, number 10, clearly I have Spots. Spots is a delightful slightly push your luck game. There's push your luck elements in the game. It's also where you are trying to complete your little dogs. So you can see you have some dogs here that you are trying to place. Like if I want to bring this dog into my, my house, my home forever, then I need to put a one value die on it and a two value die. I think there's actually another dog over here, but for what we can see, I just need to complete it by having a one value die or a two value die on it. And I'm getting those dice by choosing one of six actions. And the game comes with a lot of different action spots on it, uh, or a lot of different action tiles that you can choose to have in that for that particular game. Um, and so it leads to a lot of different combinations, a little bit like the Quacks of Quinlanburg or Libertalia Winds of Galecrest. Uh, neither of which game it actually involves rolling dice, though. And so you choose one of those actions. You're going to probably end up rolling some dice, probably going to put some of those dice on your cards, hopefully, and move towards completing six dogs. So there's push your luck. There's a lot of dice rolling. Sometimes you're rolling big handfuls of dice. And that one made me, that's what made me think of the other game in my collection that has some similar elements, and that is Dice Miner. I really, really enjoy Dice Miner. Um, dice Miner is a game of custom dice instead of standard D6 dice, although these, even the D6 dice and spots have irregular spots on them to make them feel unique. But uh, Dice Miner has a bunch of custom dice that you're drafting from a mountain, and you are using those dice 
to uh, to complete sets, to gain points, to uh, yeah, mostly completing sets and gaining points and completing sets. And the fun thing with dice miner is that every round, there are three rounds of the game, you draft all these dice, and then as you go into the next round, you get to roll all those dice again. So not only are you, are you collecting dice and doing something with them, but you're also getting to roll an increasingly large handful of dice as you play. And Spots has a similar feel. You are This is a game of dice, and you are rolling dice a lot in this game. It feels really good, and you're doing fun things with those dice. And so I thought uh, Spots and Dice Miner were a good fit. They complement each other, and yet they're different enough that uh, that I enjoy having both in my collection. So that's spy, Spots and Dice Miner at number 10. At number 9, we have Fun Facts, Ito, and The Mind. And as I'm looking at this list, I'm realizing I probably shouldn't explain the mechanisms of every single game here, but more so I'll try to talk about why these games are, are, are all three in my collection, even though they are similar. All three of these games are um, games where you're connecting with other people by ordering and cooperatively, by cooperatively um, ordering numbers sequentially, but in different ways and for different reasons. In the mind, for example, you are not communicating with the other players. You have cards with numbers in your hand, and you're trying to play them sequentially with the other players, but you can't communicate at all. Whereas Ito and Fun Facts add an element of cooperation, even though they still have varying levels of um, communication. So in Ito, for example, you're asking a question to the table, and everyone is presenting an answer for that question that is uh, relative to the number that they are trying to reveal, that they're trying to correctly put into a sequence. And then in Fun Facts, Fun Facts is, Ito is kind of a combination of Fun Facts and The Mind, but I think I get Fun Facts to the table a little bit more often than either Ito or The Mind. In Fun Facts, you are asking a question to the group. Here's the, the question here. It says, how many years of your life would you give up to become a billionaire instantly? Um, so everyone then secretly writes down an answer, puts this uh, dry erase plastic tile face down on the table with only their name facing up. And everyone kind of discusses, oh, where do we think Jamie falls in this? Where, what do we think Jamie's answer will be? Not necessarily my exact number, but relative to the other players, they're trying to order it. And we're all discussing this, except I can't give my own answer away. And then we reveal these tiles to see how closely we ordered them correctly. All Well, particularly fun facts that you tell you are learning about other people at the table. They're great getting to know you games and great games to play with people that you think you already know pretty well. Um, and the mind is similar sequential ordering, but it's about a different type of connection because you're not actually communicating with other players as you play. But of the three, I think I, I, I slightly get fun facts to the table more, but I love having all three in my collection. Um, I, I think they they do different, and I'm using the word different here about similar thing, similar games, but obviously I probably wouldn't have the exact same game, two copies of the same game in my library, but games that have this sequential ordering mechanism um, while during a cooperative, in a cooperative format, are a lot of fun for me. So fun facts, Ito in the mind at number nine. At number eight, we have some deck building games, some deck building dueling games, Star Wars deck building, Star Realms, and Shards of Infinity. All three are great deck building games. Um, and I really, I like them all for similar reasons, but also different reasons. Shards of Infinity has this great mastery mechanism where cards level up as you play and you gain more and more mastery in the game. Star Realms is just such a small game um, in terms of like how it, how easy it is to travel with, really. And it's I, I, it's very easy to get to the table. I mean, you just sit down and, and, and start playing, um, shuffle some cards and, and, and start playing. But I, I found it's great to have a, a as like the travel version of these games. I think Star Realms works really well. And Star Wars deck building, I think, has my favorite mechanisms of the bunch um, in that in terms of this galaxy row that you're interacting with throughout the game where you're not directly hurting the opponent. At least you are taking out their, their base and you're taking out some ships, but you're not removing anything permanently from their deck. But you are interacting with this galaxy row before a player has the chance to add a certain card to their deck. And even though the game isn't strongly asymmetric, aside from the bases, it ends up Th there's a lot of emergent asymmetry based on the cards that you add to your deck because I can, as the as the Empire over here, I can only add Empire cards to my deck and I can only remove Rebel cards from the Galaxy Row. So there's a lot of nice, uh, subtle emergent asymmetry that, that emerges from uh, Star Wars deck building. So I think Star Wars deck building is the one that I get to the table the most, but I like Star Realms for its travel ability and Shards of Infinity is actually a game that I play more cooperatively with Megan than, than, uh, than dueling, than competitively. Um, so I like that Shard of Infinity has that cooperative expansion in uh, Shadow of Salvation. So that's number eight, Star Wars deck building, Star Realms, and Shards of Infinity. At number seven in my collection, I have Roleplayer, Azul, and Sagrada. 
all of these are somewhat abstract games, fairly abstract games, really. Role player has the most theme, I think, of the, of the bunch of them, but it is still an abstract puzzle of placing dice in these uh, in, in this section of your player mat to try to get them to add up to certain numbers and to have colors in certain places on your mat here. You can see the color goal right here. You could, there's a, a, a some goal and additional uh, some like adding the numbers together. There's that goal, and then you have other goals that can emerge from cards that you gain. But it is an abstract puzzle involving dice. Sagrada is also an abstract puzzle involving dice, but it's just a, a different puzzle. It, it it has a different level of freedom in terms of where you can place dice and what those dice do when you place them. They don't really do anything. In role player, they're triggering benefits when you when you place dice. In Azul, you're using tiles and positioning those, you're drafting tiles and then positioning them on your player mat to try to get as many points as possible. And I prefer, I really like Azul Summer Pavilion in particular, because it also gives you some ongoing, every now and then you'll complete something and you get a special on, ongoing, or not ongoing, special one-time benefit when you complete something that goes beyond just points. You basically get more, more tokens. Um, so I really like all three. I think all three complement each other in terms of their abstract puzzle elements. Uh, but I think I get to, I get, even though it's the longest of the bunch, I actually get role player to the table the most out of the three of them. So that's at number seven, Role Player, Azul, and Sagrada. At uh, number six, we have some more uh, lighter games. And I think part of the, the, the I, something I've encountered in this list is that oftentimes the game that I, I, I tend to use these games for different situations and different uh, combinations of people and different types of people. Newer gamers might get some of, like with the Role Player, Azul, Sagrada, a newer player I might introduce to Azul or Sagrada before role player. So I like to have Azul and Sagrada into my in my collection. Someone who comes in and wants a really a, a more theme full game, but is still wants that abstract puzzle, I might lean towards role player. In this case, we have Blob Party, Just One, and Still Clover. Three more cooperative social games where you are working together with other players um, to solve a, a limited communication puzzle. Um, in Just One, you're writing down a, a clue to let someone guess a word. Um, and so Clover, you're writing down four different clues that people can talk about openly and try to um, uh, try to guess the order of some cards on the mat. And in Blob Party, uh, all three of these are wonderful games. All of these games really are wonderful games. But Blob Party is one where you're trying to write down the same thing as everyone else. So you're answering for yourself, but you're also constantly empathizing and thinking of the other players and thinking of what they might write down. So you'll have a, a word and a category in this game. And it might be like... Um, uh, I, I I don't know, uh, uh, by, uh, uh, animals, and it might say animals and travel. So travel animals. So you're trying to think, oh, are, are other people going to write down animals that you travel with or animals that you encounter when you're traveling? So you're kind of, you're thinking about what other players might write down, and you're also thinking of what came first to my mind, because maybe that's what other people are thinking of. And as you end up revealing the same clues as, as other players, you join their blob. You become one cohesive blob with those other, other players, and you are then presenting just one answer as a group from then on for the rest of the game. I, I love these limited, limited communication social puzzles, especially when they are cooperative. cooperative and uh, yeah, I really enjoy Blob Party, Just One, and So Clover at number six. And so I have all of them in my collection. At number five, in my collection, I have three different games where I have uh, that feature one-way action selection tracks, and those are First in Flight, shown here, Parks, and Glenmore 2. I really like all three of these games I, for different reasons. I, I love Parks at low player counts. You're moving along a trail, uh, gathering resources to com essentially complete uh, 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 national parks. So you're trying to gain and complete national parks. In Glenmore 2, there's a tile placement puzzle. So you're moving al along these tiles. You claim the tile that you get. You place that tile. You get a bunch of bonuses from that tile. And uh, and in First in Flight, you are advancing on this track as far ahead as you want. So you can jump way ahead. But the the idea with all, all these games is if you jump way ahead to grab something that you really want, the players behind you get to take many more turns because you only get to turn take a turn when they catch up to you. Um, this is also a theme in, in, uh, in Tokaido. In fact, I didn't even, admit, I should add Namiji to this list because Namiji is still in my collection. Namiji. Um, so uh, I'll add Namiji on there as well, but first in flight has this really nice track where you're trying to decide how far ahead do I want to jump? And one of the key spaces on this track is the space that says that you try out a flight, that you take your deck that you've been building and you try to fly with it and you see how well you can fly. Um, 
And uh, that's, that's how you advance in the game. That's how you win the game by having a flight of a certain length. And so it's really crucial that, um, that you take those flights when possible. And also as you do that, as you take a flight, you get to learn more about your deck. Like you learn cards that are clogging up your deck. Um, and you get to get rid of them. You get to after you've seen them, you get to repair them, and get out of your deck. So, it one of the spaces that you that you are constantly eyeing on this track are the flight spaces. Um, and I love that. I, lo I love that uh, there there might be rounds might go by where you just don't go ahead and grab those spaces, and other players might take them. But you're gaining other bonuses along the way. So, in terms of these one way action selection tracks, I think first in flight is it edges a little bit Parks Glen more two and Namiji, but I really love all four of them. I love this mechanism. And number four, we have some worker placement games. So uh, at, for worker placement, I have Santa's Workshop, Everdell, and a couple different Stonemaier games. I'll throw Viticulture on there as uh, maybe the, the worker placement game that I go to a little bit more often than, uh, say, Euphoria. Charterstone is a campaign game, so I don't go to that one. I, I've played through the campaign twice, but uh, I haven't played it since then. Um, but yeah, these worker placement, I love worker placement as a mechanism. And so I love having worker placement games in my collection. I have more than just these in my collection, but these are the ones that are kind of at that medium weight, almost medium lightweight category. No, I'd say medium. I'd say medium weight. So they're not too heavy. They're not too long, but they give you plenty of interesting choices with the workers. And they often involve, um, they involve some positive player interaction. Not, not, not too much, but some. Santa's Workshop has the most positive player interaction of the bunch. And that's probably why I'm putting it at the top of the list right now. But I really do love the village building in Everdell. In Viticulture, I love all the uh, I love the order of operations puzzle in, in Viticulture and trying to get grapes on your crush pad so they can be pass passively aging wine in your cellar so it can be passively aging. Um, but I really enjoyed Santa's Workshop. It's a fairly recent discovery of mine. Um, but uh, so, yeah, th these worker placement games, They'll always have a place in my collection. And right now, I'm, I, the sweet spot for me is the medium weight worker placement games with Santa's Workshop, Everdell, and Viticulture at number four. At number three, we have Apiary, another Stillmeyer game, and Honey Buzz. And I'm going to give Apiary the edge here. I like both of the puzzles in this game. Both of these are B-themed uh, hive building puzzles with hex tiles and worker placement. And yet beyond that, and so it sounds like they're very similar games. Beyond that, they're actually very different games. Um, uh, the worker placement in Honey Buzz works completely different than in Apiary. In Honey Buzz, for, you're, you, ha you have to add, you're, adding mul you're placing multiple workers at a time because you have to place more workers than the previous player who used that action space. And the high building is really satisfying in Honey Buzz. You're trying to uh, pair together these hexes to gain, uh, at the at not every turn, but on certain turns when you put the hexes down and you complete a little little uh, uh honeycomb type area in, in your in, in your in, in your area your tableau then you trigger a bunch of different bonuses on those tiles that feels really really good at least these really powerful turns um in apiary you are also building a hive your hive mat your your hive ship essentially um, but you're doing so by exploring by adding these carving tiles or a bunch of other tiles that are on a, another photo here you're getting more workers you're getting these seed cards uh you're performing dances um there's a, a couple of different mini games that are that are happening in this game. Most of them geared around some form of positive player interaction and around leveling up. So both of these games have these moments that feels really strong. When you place that tile in Honey Buzz that completes the right honeycomb and you get a bunch of bonuses, that feels really strong. In Apiary, when you place a Strength 4B, now, uh, uh, Honey Bee, or not Honey Bee, a uh, bee, a uh, worker, you get a really powerful benefit for that action. So you're building up to these Strength 4 turns that feel really good. Um, again, ga two games that sound very similar, but I really like having both of them in my collection because they ac actually end up playing quite differently. Apiary and Honey Buzz. And number three. And number two, we have uh, Fantasy Realms and Red Rising. So Red Rising is a Stillmeyer game that was inspired by the core mechanism in Fantasy Realms, which is that you get you start the game with a hand of cards, and those cards give you points or even take away points for different reasons. And over the course of the game, you are crafting your hand so that you score the most points from your hand at the end of the game. We added a few layers to that in Red Rising, um, but it uses a very similar mechanism. I, you, you, you are crafting a hand of cards. And I don't know, I, this type of game really surprised me because you are starting off with a completely random hand of cards. And that hand of cards could combo together really well, or it could not combo together. The cards could not com combo together at all. Either way, it feels 
like opening a booster pack of Magic the Gathering, I feel like sometimes when, when you do this, because you get this, this hand of cards that's just, it, it can be magical, the combos that you have there. And if you, even if it isn't magical at that moment, you're going to have cards that score a ton of points if you combo them with other cards. So you're looking for other specific cards. Like if I open, if I, if my opening hand has this unicorn, it says bonus plus 30 points if I can find a princess. And so even if I don't have this princess in my hand yet, I'm actively looking for it. I'm really trying to find that princess. And if I can, if I can get it, if I can grab that princess from the, the public row in my turn, it feels really, really good. Um, it has again with like candle luck plus 100 points if i have the book of changes and the bell tower they're showing like a really really nice hand how this worked out here but yeah i love this handcrafting element of fantasy realms and i think i'm putting fantasy realms ahead of red rising here not because i don't love red rising i'm the co-designer of it i really love the game but fantasy realms does play faster and so it is a little bit easier to get to the table than red rising so i'm going to pick fantasy realms here at number two but I like having both it and Red Rising in my collection. Last at number one, we have all games that share a number of similarities, games that involve a lot of cards and are about tableau building, engine building. These are Wormspan, Arc Nova, Earth, Forced Shuffle, and Wingspan. And perhaps it's just my bias because uh, it's new and because I love this game. I'm putting Wormspan at the top of this list, but really, these are all wonderful games. Again, all games on this top 10 list are wonderful. This is number one, the number one slot, though. So I really, really love these games. Wormspan, Arc Nova, Earth, Force Shuffle, and Wingspan. All of these involve a number of unique cards that you are comboing together with other cards in some form of tableau, of a tableau. In Arc Nova, the focus is more around actually playing the card and then gaining income benefits and ongoing benefits from the cards that you play. Earth, you are putting down trees on the table and, you're, and you are occupying those trees with different forest creatures and critters and flora and fauna. Uh, I'm sorry, that Earth, that's forest shuffle. In Earth, you are creating an island, a four by four grid of cards that, uh, that you get to activate time and time again over the course of the game. And it, similar to Earth, in Wingspan and Wormspan, you are playing uh, cards birds or dragons and then you are getting to activate rows of cards as you play in Wormspan through the explore action where you take your little adventurer and you move them from card to card down the row Wormspan adds the extra element of cave cards that you have to play before you can play a dragon on a slot and a cave gives you a one-time benefit when you play that cave card when you put it into play uh, I've been I've been really loving Wormspan. I've been having a lot of fun from uh, the discovery element of seeing what the different dragons do when they combo with each other. Uh, the 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 coins in the game, how you don't have a set number of actions, you can gain more and more actions over the course of the game. Um, and I love the art and design. I love the look of the caves. I love the look of the dragons. I've I've just been having a lot of fun with Wormspan. But I will gladly always play Wormspan, Arc Nova, Earth, Force Shuffle, and Wingspan. And I think each of these do different things. Uh, that that uh, keep them coming back to the table in my collection. They're different lengths. Like I think Four Shuffle is the shortest of them. Uh, Arc Nova is probably the longest. But uh, but I I don't know. I really love these tableau building games. Where you're building this tableau of unique cards that feels very different than any previous time that you played. And oftentimes these games involve a few car cards of varying cost or varying difficulty of actually giving them into play. And so there might be cards that you play early in the early in the game that are very easy to play. That feels good. You're building your engine. But there are also some cards that are a lot harder to play, and it feels really satisfying when you get those cards to the table too. So yeah, that is my number one slot for this list. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic. Take a look at your collection and see if you have any games that are very similar to each other or have some strong similarities to each other, and yet you believe that they both belong in your collection. You do actually get these games to the table from time to time, or both of these games, or all these groups of games to the table. I love celebrating games in this way. I, um, I that, that different games can elevate each other or complement each other in this way, that it can be good. Similar games can be good in different circumstances. Games don't have to kill each other. Games don't have to replace each other. I do understand that we have limited space in our collection, so that does happen sometimes, but I don't want to talk about it. I'd rather talk about the games that, that stay in my collection that I love and that I'm having fun with, and that even though they're similar to each other, I am happy to have them in, on my table and on my shelves. So yeah, that's my list of, game, of top 10 games that are similar to each other, and yet I still keep them in my collection. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks.